Hey guys, and welcome back to another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Illumination by Alf Siegert, a game of medieval monks and illuminated manuscripts. This is by Eagle Griffin. It plays one to two players. It takes about 40 minutes to play and is for ages 13 and up. And in the game, you're going to be playing as one of the two different sides, the light side or the dark side. And depending on who you play as, it will determine whether you go first or not. The other player is going to get a certain number of coins. In the game, you're basically going to be getting rows and columns of tiles and you'll be taking a row or a column of your tiles placing it onto the side section of one of the three books in front of you and then placing them onto that book in the specific quill spaces your objective is to match colors and to match sides of colors by other tiles placed you're attempting to gather certain uh, types of these little uh, coins here there's gonna be different colors and you'll be turning those in in sets to gather more victory points you'll also be fighting your opponent so the red will always fight the white there's going to be uh, combative factions on each side of the tile so the dragons will fight the knights and the angels will fight the demons and you've got the uh, scripters fighting the rabbits and so on and so forth and based on the total amount of uh, adjacent facing uh, types you're going to be calculating those so if you have three dragons and you have two knights and everything else surrounding those guys is a rabbit or a monk or something like that then those will fight and the side that has more will win flipping the other side over thusly losing points for the other player at the end of the game you'll score points based on the sets of books that you collect based on how you transcribe your tokens onto the books presented you'll score points by having the most face-up units on the boards and you're going to score points for each of the battles that you've won throughout the game it's a one or two player game so generally speaking you're going to be combative going back and forth with a similar notion to the game of go where you're placing down those black or white specific little uh, stones onto the board trying to have the most surrounding another opponent's stone and thus flipping it over to your side or your faction this plays similarly to that but with more factions in mind and some set collection and of course scriptorum cards that you can utilize to change the rows and columns on your own board allowing you to select pieces that you'd like to use in order to place them onto the books complete all the books and the game will trigger the ending and whoever has the most points is the winner in the game illumination let's take a look down below show you what comes with and how to play the game and then we'll talk about what I think about it. Welcome to the game Illumination by Eagle Griffin Games. I have this currently set up for two players but if you'd like you can play the single player mode described in the rule book. Let's talk about how to play as well as what is included in setup for the two player game. The first thing you'll notice is three books here. You'll place them based on the rules where they tell you to they have front and backs but in general you have book one, two, and three. However books are based on how you are looking at them so if you're looking on this side books will be one, two, and three and if you're on this side over here books will be one, two, and three. You'll take one of these wilds on place them on each of the books here. Uh, the wilds are going to be these purple uh, tiles here, place them on one of the script scripture areas and place them randomly. Just to make it fair, you'll want to try and place as many quills around those spaces as you possibly can. Each player is going to get their own player board. There's the white board and the black board. You're going to be giving each player coins based on that board's amount presented. This white player will get one, and the black player is going to get five. Set the rest of the coins next to your player board because you will be using them throughout the game. You'll also be getting a certain number of markers. These markers are used to track battles as well as points at the end of the game that you'll be getting, as well as you'll be getting tiles. The white player will get white tiles indicated by the white bars on the front side and the white card on the back side. Shuffle these guys up and fill out these rows and columns here. You should have nine on your board and then make nine stacks of three and place them like this for each player. After you've done that, give every single player a turn summary as well as an indication for how battle wor battles work and give them one scriptorum card. Shuffle the rest of the cards in that deck and place it next to their player board. They'll be using those for later. Then each player is going to randomly choose one of these battle cards. Keep this hidden. This is bonus points for the end of the game if you can defeat the indicated icon on your card. So the white is battling against demons and the black player is going to be battling against dogs. These scriptorum cards are action cards. You'll be getting more of them. However, the battle cards you will not be. Once you have this, that is it. It's just a bonus way of scoring points at the end of the game. Another thing to note, too, is the die is for single play. You can set that aside and make sure the markers are next to the players. Over here, these are battle cards here. You'll just randomly place them down. It doesn't really matter where you place them. And this card here specifically tells you that whenever somebody flips over one of their cards in battle, they're going to get a coin. 
This is the main board of the game, indicating the monk here. Place him on one of the four empty spaces presented here. So I'll place him right here. And then place all of the extra tokens in a by color next to this board with an easy reach of all the players. The rest of the battle cards can be set here, or they can just be set outside of the game for a later, later game that you can play. Then you're ready to begin the game. To begin the game, it's very simple. There's only three things you're technically going to do on your turn. The first thing is you're going to select a row or a column, and then you're going to take the tiles from that row or column. If you select a row that is one, you'll have to place it on book one. If you select it on two, book two and three, and the same goes for columns and rows. When you take that, so for instance, let's say I wanted to go ahead and take this one here. I will go ahead and take column one. I'll place it on book one as indicated by the white player, and I'll put those in the margins. From there, you are then going to position those onto the book. You can only position tiles on quills. You can't position them on these words here, the text here, unless you have a card that otherwise states so. Whenever you have a scriptorum card, you can go ahead and use the, these on your turn if they are viable or available for you to use. They're basically bonus free actions that you can use. If not, you'll simply go ahead and place these down. You can place them down on any of these areas here. There are coins in the game that will allow you to change uh, where you can position tiles and on what book, even after choosing a specific row or column. But for now, we'll just go ahead and place them on this board here. If you place a tile on a quill of the same color, you will score a coin that you can use for later. If you place it um, next to a wild tile, you will score a, a tile here represented by the color that you place. So for instance, I'll take a brown or gray, I should say, uh, one of these guys, these bells, and place it in my supply. Because it's next to a wild, it will count. You can also score, if I have this guy instead, uh, an additional one whenever you place next to one of the same color. So by placing this guy next to this guy here, I will score one of these as well. And that would net me two, which I need when trying to turn them in at this little monastery board here. After placing my tiles down in the appropriate spaces, I would then be able to end my turn and I would take these guys here and uh, from the top left all the way to the right and then you'll go all the way down and then place them randomly down on your board filling in the remaining spaces so the next turn you'll have the same amount of options as you did this turn and it would pass to the next player's turn and that player would simply go ahead and decide which uh, row they want so for instance if I wanted to I could take these guys here it would go from two so this would be my two I'd place them in the margins and now let's talk about some coins here there are different things you can do with coins. The first thing is if you take a tile with a coin symbol on it, you're going to gain that many coins. And in this case, I would gain two. You can only have seven coins total, just like you can only have seven of these markers total. So you're going to want to spend them. You can spend two coins in order to draw an extra scriptorum card to be used later. You could spend a coin to move one tile from one book's margins to another. So I can go from two to one, or I can go from two to three based on my positioning. So maybe if I wanted to, I'd do this, and maybe I'd spend another coin to move this guy over here. Coin tiles, like these that you saw, are discarded after you gain them. They are not placed on the board in any way. Uh, another thing that you can do with coins is you can move this guy here. Now, like I said before, when placing these guys down, if you place to an adjacent tile of the same color, you're gonna gain these. If you gain enough of these over time, I'll just go ahead and place this one over here, like give me a white and a gray. Uh, if you gain enough of these over time, so let's say that I had three of these, I could spend a coin to move this monk to um, an adjacent space, either left or right. And I can spend as many coins as I want to move him as far as I would like. And in this case, I'm just moving him from here to here. If you have the required tokens to turn in, in this case I have three, you can return them back to the supply, take one of your markers, and place it on that indicated space, netting you points at the end of the game. You can get a maximum of seven and a minimum of two points for each of the four different colors. Another thing you can do to place markers on this board here is whenever you fill an entire page, if you are the one who did it, you'll place a marker on one of the three books here, and you'll take one of these guys for free. Uh, finally, whenever a player places a marker on any of these spaces here, the other player will get a free scriptorum card. So in this instance, they would get two if this happened on um, for the black player. The last thing you need to know is battling. Battling happens when uh, differentiating factions collide. Whenever you see an angel and a demon and they're positioned next to each other, that means a battle has begun. And the only way a battle concludes is when the spaces around that specific, um, I'll just go ahead and place some of these out to show you how a battle works, uh, specific combat is filled. 
So here, this would be a battle because there's an angel and a demon next to the, next to each other. If uh, the adjacent sides, up, down, left, and right, do not have demons in them, that concludes the battle. So right here, we'll check this, up, down, left, and right. In this case, there's an angel here, so we'll keep going, up, down, left, or right. These two are stopping the battle. Up here, there's a demon, and up, down, or left, or right, these two would stop the battle. Thusly, the battle is concluded right here. You'll check the numbers, two to one. Flip over the lower-valued uh, tiles, and in this case, there's just one. And then uh, the player who had the demons is the winner. So that player, black, would specifically put a token on one of those battle cards, which would get them five points at the end of the game. Whenever you flip over a tile, that other player will gain a coin. And uh, they also are going to lose points based on any cards, or they're not going to gain points in the game based on any tiles that are flipped over. So at the end of the game, you'll check each book, and for every face-up tile you have on that book, you'll score points. So winning battles is relatively important. And that's pretty much the entirety of the game. You're going to keep going on until either you choose to pass, meaning you do not want to play anymore, or if all three books get filled. The reason why you might want to pass is because if a book gets filled and you have to place specific tokens on there for some reason or another and you can't, don't have the coins to pay for them, whenever you don't place a tile or can't place a tile, they'll go into your little sheeps area here, and that means you're going to lose that many points at the end of the game. So if you're only going to lose points on your turn, I suggest you pass. But if you do, that will give the other player as many turns as they need to continue until they also pass or all three books are filled, in which case scoring would begin in the game. Uh, let's do a little overview here. The first thing is you're going to choose a column. So for instance, let me go ahead and fill this, this board back up here. You're going to take them, place them in the book corresponding to that, place them down, scoring any coins and or tile tokens that you would get based on where you placed. Then you're going to simply take another stack and place them in the spots that you had lost and continue to the next player's turn, going back and forth until all three books are filled, or one player passes and then the other finishes by passing or the game ending. How you calculate points is fairly simple. The first thing you would check is you would check your battle and to see if you, how many of the, bat, of the baddies a specific faction type you beat. So in this case, if I beat one dog, I get one point. If I flipped over four dogs or more, I get 10 points. Also check your battle cards here. Whoever has the most tokens on each of them will score five points. For each of these areas here, if you have a marker on them, you're going to score the indicated number of points. And for every face-up tile of your color on each of these three books, you're going to score one point. And that's pretty much it. Other than losing points from the sheeps here, whoever has the most points in the game Illumination is the winner. Like I said, it's similar to the game Go in a lot of ways, but it also has unique faction types and some differentiating things like cards and whatnot. But I felt like the Go aspect in this game is really vivid. Let's come up and discuss my review of the game, what I thought whether or not you should pick this game up and then you can let me know what you think down below in the comment section. The game Illumination reminds me of the game Go. I've said this a couple times now, but I want to illustrate that because it's a, a very similar process, but it has a lot of unique concepts. Now, in general, uh, you are placing tiles, attempting to start battles and finish them. You want to win the battles. It's very important. They also want to make the best placement you possibly can. The reason why white goes first and has less coins is because placement matters and utilizing those wild spots will net you those free tiles at the beginning of the game, thusly allowing you to go to the monastery, move the monk around, and return those in order to gain points based on the number of sets, uh, uh, tiles in the set that you have. Having more tiles of the same color is going to be better. Remember, you're limited to seven at any point in time, so you'll need to be turning those in as quickly as you possibly can, as many as you possibly can of the same color. Finishing books is not so bad either. You'll, you'll net yourself a bonus card or tile, I should say, of a chosen type. But remember, whenever you place on that board, your opponents are going to get those uh, scriptorum cards that will allow them to utilize special, special or unique actions throughout the game. Uh, these guys can help you with allowing you to either move one of your tiles already in a book to a new book of any type, or move the abbot pond to any station on the monastery. That's actually a really useful uh, action there. When placing tiles this turn, you can put one of them on a quill, uh, instead of on a quill, on a text space. Normally you can't place on text spaces, this card would change that. Or being able to exchange any two tiles on your player mat. So on your actual mat where you have the columns and rows, you can switch two tiles of your choice, letting you gather the specific tiles you need and place them on the specific book you need. And they go on from there, with my favorite being 
writ us or write us, uh, in which case you can gain a ritual token, those tiles of the specific colors or those tokens, that will allow you to turn them in into the monastery. It's a good way of scoring additional points and getting the higher amount of sets that you need, because it's going to come down to, do you want to battle? Do you want to gain coins? Do you want to gain tokens? And can you do a mix of all three? It's possible, and those are the best combinations. But you're limited based on your board, based on the rows, based on the columns where you choose to pull from and how you choose to pull. So having those cards there as an extra way to utilize them when you need, but also having a specific limited amount based on either having to pay for them with coins or by having to get them when your opponent scores uh, is one of the, the detriments, I suppose. You're only limited to seven coins, and of course you're going to want to spend them throughout the game as much as you possibly can. If you need to run out of coins, feel free to do so. You're going to gain more as you play and as you're placed down. This game seemed rather complex, especially as to how battles were concerning me when I was playing originally, because I didn't really grasp it. It took me like two or three turns before I understood the idea. To sum it up, basically a battle ensues when two opposing factions meet, and the battle concludes when all adjacent sides of every space that is not attached to one of the opposing factions is of a different faction. So if you have angel, angel, demon, and then everything else around them is not an angel, angel, or I'm not an angel or a demon. That's when the battle will conclude. The angels will beat the demon out, the demon will flip over, and the angels team will score the point, as well as the demon will have to gain a coin but lose a point at the end of the game. And of course, these battles can be large battles, they can flip over multiple tiles, and multiple coins can be gained, and points lost at the end of the game, or it can just be a 1 1. If it's ever a tie, it's just concluded as a draw, in which case there is similarity or whatever the word is, polarity amongst the amongst the tribes. Um, and, th and that does happen. It's not a huge amount of battling though. Maybe three to six battles a game. It could go more if you're really aggressive in how you place, but realizing that you need to get those coins to be able to get those tiles and specifically where you want to place your tiles down the board so that you can get those big points on the monastery board, that's the most important. Uh, and a, a good way of utilizing that board is having your opponent move the monk and try and plan your actions in accordance to where they're going to move them so it will save you coins. Anything that can save you coins is going to be beneficial and then spending them when you really need them is going to help as well. If you can close out a book or close out a battle, you're going to want to try and do that as well. Net the most gain on your turn as possible. Get the most return that you possibly can. That's always the most important thing. For beginning players, I always suggest to place on the spaces around the wilds, especially at the beginning of the game, that will net you those tokens to get you ahead of the black player who starts with more coins than you because you get that first placement, which makes all the difference. Try and make sure that you don't surround your tiles too too much by those page spaces because if you do, the opposing player is going to block you off and thus win battles. Winning battles is good. Even if they just win one battle of a faction, that's five points if you cannot fight another battle of the opposing faction, in which case they're going to get up to six points uh, at least in a, a single game if you never fight that specific faction match again. So you need to be careful with that. Battles obviously are going to be detrimental for you to win. Also collecting those tokens, it's all obviously really important as well. I love the artwork for this game. I love the quality of this game. It sits really well with me because it's so simple to play. And once you get over the hurdle of understanding the idea behind taking from columns and placing them on books based on the side that you're on, it's a pretty, pretty easy breeze to play. It's quite simple. This is another great two-player game. I haven't had a chance to play the solo mode yet, but I have played the two-player game quite a few times, and I can tell you that I really, really, really enjoyed it, especially because it's a puzzly sort of game, and I was able to beat Callie. And I don't mean beat, I mean stomper. Uh, so much so that you want, you want to play again right after, in which case, uh, I also won. But I still enjoyed myself. It was a lot of fun. Um, so high quality components. Obviously the pages of the books are going to be more thinner, but, you, but, but um, that's kind of the idea of the game. You're feeling like you're placing on these pages of these books and trying to cover these, these, I, these, these things. Up. I, the only thing I guess, I suppose, that I wish there was more of was maybe a, more of a story to the game. I only saw that it says a game of mad monks, medieval monks and illustrated manuscripts. The idea, I guess, is you're just placing... Your monks are like building books um, and illustrating stories about factions fighting each other in in some medieval 
you know, era. But otherwise, though, solid game. If you like two-player games, you want a two-player head-on experience, it's got aggressive combat style, it's got a puzzly nature, has choices that you need to make down the line, as well as how you use your cards to facilitate those choices, this is definitely a game I would suggest. If you want more than two players, not the game for you. And of course, if you don't like games that are aggressive, also not the game for you either. The game's rather quick and you can play roughly easily again. There's a little bit of setup involved in the game, but uh, nothing that wouldn't take you more than about five or six minutes to play. Overall, a solid game. Illumination is a great game. I highly suggest it. Take a look down below, link in the description if you're interested in picking up this game. And of course, let me know what you think about the game in the comment section below. Thank you for watching another Unfiltered Gamer board game review for the game Illumination by Eagle Griffin. This two player game of complex medieval monks. If you're interested in checking out the game, you know where to go. Also, subscribe to the channel. Hit that subscribe button and of course the bell notification button so you can see more of our videos every day. We usually produce them somewhere around four o'clock. And of course our live stream every Wednesday, meaning today, 6.30 p.m. PST, where we play games just like this one. And I think we're actually gonna be playing uh, Ping Yao, the Chinese's first private banks game. You'll be checking out that one. It's on Kickstarter as well. Uh, tonight. And if you're interested, you can back that one as well. Uh, you can also go ahead and hit up our website, unfilteredgamer.com, blog posts, giveaways, kickstart lists, and more. And Moonshell, a mermaid game by my wife, Callie Wright. This game is coming out in March, uh, March 2nd, I believe. And you can follow that on moonshellgame.com, as well as, of course, the Facebook groups and whatnot. This is a puzzle-style game that has a lot of variety, a lot of choices, a lot of options, and it feels similar to games like <clears throat> and uh, Hetris, uh, you know, those those games I probably can't say due to copyright. But uh, if you like those style match three games, this one's gonna be for, fun for you, fun for the family. And it's one I suggest even as a non-puzzling person. Anyway, thank you guys so much for watching. And as always, I look forward to dealing with medieval monks and illustrious illuminations, illustrations, in instigations with you next time.